Thank you, Ghalibay, for the invitation, and I would like to thank uh, Al-Sharq Forum and AMEC for the invitation, and also to hearing so many things about the challenges and the problems that we face in the Middle East and North Africa. But indeed, we have to be realistic. We should not stay at 30,000 feet high in the sky to discuss the problems of the Middle East. The problems of the Middle East are not only the regional superpowers, if I may call them, to sit down and discuss, ignoring the existence of the others. This is one of the main problems. When you deny the others, when you deny the existence of the others on the ground, whether they are sub-state actors, sub-national actors, or non-state actors. Talking about this region, we have to address this reality that the whole world lives in turmoil. So the world order has a problem in itself. Therefore, MENA region cannot be tackled in isolation if we want to address real issues on the ground. We have to be able to identify the problems, sit down together if we wanted a solution, and to try to prescribe a roadmap how to address them. Do we want solutions or do we want status quo to continue? Do we want problems and challenges to be part of our nature of daily life and live with it? Or we want to put an end to these problems and come up with solutions that would bring about peace and stability? There are a number of issues that need to be dealt with. Sovereignty. Sometimes sovereignty is used for protection. Sometimes it's used for oppression. Where does it stand? We have to review the literature of the United Nations, etc. Identity, be that national identity, ethnic identity, religious identity, or uh, sectarian identity. Resources. Where do governments and states stand in terms of resources? Are they for some of the, the elite or the people? I've heard a lot about the people in the MENA region, but I personally do not believe that people come first. People in the MENA region come last. So therefore, we have to review and be realistic in addressing that, and not to be neither academic nor diplomatic, be realistic in addressing the issues, what are the problems, and how can we get about a stage when we bring about peace and order and stability and prosperity. We have many challenges. We have the rise of terrorism, extremism, and fundamentalism. We have the problems of displacement, migration, asylum seekers. And also, we have a continued state of denial. People, communities are denied their existence, denied their rights. And such kind of situation will not continue to lead to any solutions. People need to be respected and accepted accepted, respected, and included in the process if we were to have any inclusive and representative process. So that's why it would not lead it. We are dealing with some failed state in the region, maybe elsewhere in the world as well. But these, uh, some of them are failed, some of them are fragile, and some of them are in the wake of being so. What we see from the perspective of a subnational actor is that sometimes they just want to delay the process or deport the crisis into some other day, as if this is not my problem, let the next generation deal with that, and this is not a policy. The overall situation is at risk, with too many challenges. The tension between I Iran and the United States and what will come about on the 12th of May. Tension between Iran and Israel. Tension between Saudi Arabia and Iran. These are problems that will have ramification and it will impact our region. What would that lead to? The division which is there among the GCC. The status quo between Qatar and Saudi Arabia. And also in some other countries we see that there is war on terror, but at the same time there, are, there is internal fighting or more than an internal fighting, as it is the situation in Syria. In Iraq, the war on ISIS has ended as the Islamic State, but war on terror remains in Iraq. So it's not over yet. That's why we have to be realistic in dealing with this. Going back to Syria, the tension and the disagreement which is there between the United States and Russia has also an impact on what's going on and what will be the future. If 
governments, peoples, regional actors in the MENA region want to find the solution, then there has to be a collective security mechanism so that they all part, play a part in this, bringing about a security system that they feel it's their own. Maybe you last year you called it architecture, this time arrangements. Okay, it could be, for example, GCC to have a security of its own, an arrangement that would be specific or relevant to GCC. Another thing for another area, but after all, the, the MENA region need to have some arrangements that they all feel part of that strategy. In the absence of coordination and cooperation, then definitely there wouldn't be any stability. We have to deal with the reality that such kind of problems will continue and we have to deal with them as if it's the way of life. The Palestinian question, Israel and Palestine, has continued for 48 years. Do we want that to continue and add numbers to that and commemorate it? Or do we want to put an end to this and sit down with the main players and see where do we see a solution? The Kurdish question in the Middle East cannot be denied forever. It's a question, it's there, it needs to be addressed. By denying a problem, you cannot present a solution. Be realistic, sometimes you're talking at, at a level that you don't see the real problems. Then it comes the issue of water, it comes the issue of natural resources, others and others. That's why let's define the problems, identify the challenges, and what would be the best mechanism to come up with solutions. We do understand that there are interests. Superpowers have their own interests, regional powers have interests, but also peoples and states have interests. Why shouldn't we sit down together and see where can we find a common ground? It's not impossible. Everything is possible if we are looking for a solution. But if we want to put or play the blame game to blame governments, to blame state, non-state actors or others, then we would never find that solution. And we have seen, for example, some countries have used oil for the prosperity of their region or their country, their people, have used it for building and reconstruction, and they have brought prosperity. Others were not able to use it properly. They used it for militarizing the country, <coughs> used it for destruction, and this did not lead to uh, prosperity and stability. Therefore, we can count on resources to play an important role if that was dealt with properly and also there has been a fair distribution of the wealth. <clears throat> I believe we have to be honest with ourselves when we sit down together away from complementary statements, accept each other, and also to have a clear separation between state and religion. We are paying a price of that. A clear separation of religion and state so that we can have a democratic state or civilized states or modern states whatever you call it, because the issue of the border is something. If we were to assume or to lift and remove the boundaries and the borders and deal with peoples, can we find solutions for the MENA region? If the borders were the problem, let's assume for one day that these borders do not exist. Let's sit down as nations and as people to find solutions for them. Being honest, accepting each other, respecting each other, agreeing on the rights of all these communities, denying none, coming with solutions that would satisfy all the partners, I believe that would help some of the people to get rid of their superiority complex. Some see themselves in this region very superior, they, to a level that they don't even see the others. That's the problem, demonizing other people. We have to think about solutions that come voluntarily and not imposing their will on the others. Collective security or joint security, an integrated economy, and also putting people first would come up with a solution. As for the referendum that you mentioned, the referendum came as a result of the desperation and disappointment of the leaders region that Baghdad did not abide by the constitution and the social bond that we have.
agreed upon. The people and leadership of Kurdistan region in 2003 went to Baghdad voluntarily to build a new country, a federal, democratic, pluralistic country, to build a system that would be inclusive, representative, that we would all be equal. What went, wrong, what went wrong was the implementation of this. And this is why we wanted to do that peacefully and through negotiation, but unfortunately, negotiation and our peaceful approach was rejected. And we had seen maybe in the question and answer, I think that was more. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I